Two balls and a strike to count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. It's his way back. Walk him out. Chris Taylor. What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads Live, presented by DodgerBlue.com. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined tonight by Anthony Wittrado, here for a late, late post-game show after the Dodgers go to extra innings in a 8-7 to loss against the Padres. Uh, there's a lot of directions that we're going to get to, a lot of conversations to be had about the bullpen, about the offense, about some decisions Dave Roberts made. We're going to get to all that. We'll get to your comments. We appreciate the folks joining us live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter as well. But Anthony, where do you want to start on this one? The Dodgers were up 7-3 to three at one point. They end up losing 8-7 to seven in 11 innings. What was your biggest takeaway or reaction to the game that we just saw? I, I think just speaking overall about it, it was probably the most frustrating game of the season. Um, you know, they, they've had some they, – they've had some ugly losses, and every team has. You know, it's it, it, it kind of goes with – with just having expectations, yeah. but I think top to bottom, this was probably the most frustrating game I've watched this season from the Dodgers. Um, squandered a whole bunch of opportunities, yeah, uh, including in in that tenth inning when it seemed tailor made for them to to pull that out. Yeah. Uh, or I'm sorry, in the ninth inning and in the tenth inning. Uh, and I think that you know you you look at the bullpen and I text you. <laughs> I'm not one for hyperbolic panic or anything like that. I think I've kind of proven that over the course of my appearances with uh, with you. But you start to think like, look, okay, the bullpen is – they're going to have some guys coming back, and we'll get a little more into this later. But some of the guys who are in there right now are going to be in there in October or they're yeah. going to have to be or or even late September. And there's, there's a little bit – I have trust issues right now with this bullpen. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't blame you. And again, we'll get into that. Um, as we dive into this, there's bullpen questions again. Um, we have a super chat here from Carlos Cervantes trade Lux for Adamas and Muncie for Arenado. Uh, he, he's seen enough. Look, I mean, one of the talking points here tonight that we're going to get to, and, and we could dive in now is the decision to remove Gavin Lux from this game. Um, it makes sense to me to have Miguel Rojas be a defensive substitution, but Gavin Lux was taken out of this game. Um, and I had somebody in, in my mentions pointing out that Rojas actually has pretty good splits against lefties. He's historically better against lefties than Gavin Lux is. But you saw the flip side to that. Well, then once you get into extra innings, now you've got Miguel Rojas that's still right. in there taking in at bat when there isn't a lefty on the mound. And so, um, you know, I, I understand the sympathy here from uh, Carlos here that you you coming off of a loss like tonight anthony i understand the desire to change something to make some moves muncie ironically enough ends up hitting a home run in this one but um it, i will say the way they handled gavin lux tonight uh doesn't bode well i don't think for kind of his future it doesn't speak well to his standing maybe in the mind of dave roberts yeah you know you and i have been um kind of in Lux's corner from spring training and, and through the start of the season. Yeah. Um, but I'm with you. I think if they're going to, if they're going to handle him this way, you have to see what you can get for him at this point. Yeah. And, and you and I were, were firmly in the, on the side of, you know, do not trade him yet. Uh, you know, let, let this play out a little more, but if you're going to, he's, he seems to be in, in mostly a strict platoon at this point yeah. and, you know, getting subbed out the way he is, um, and I and I understand it over it, it improves the defense overall because you get, you know, probably the equivalent defensively back at second base but with a better shortstop when you when yeah. you bring in Rojas and move Mookie over. So I understand that part of it, but but you know, if if it really is coming to that, then I think you have to explore what your options are. And like I said, you know, I'm not one for hyperbole, you know, two weeks into the season, but and and I'm I'm not on I'm not on board with you know making any major moves. Um, you know, there's there's nothing really out there at this point anyway. You know, Adamas yeah. is is on a team that's playing well right now. And you know, I for them to give up on him at this point is kind of gonna make it, you know, it's gonna feel like punting on their season for that fan base. Um and you know, so I, I'm not I'm not of the mind that you know you make huge changes right now from through the trade market, but yeah. I do think if you're gonna handle Lux this way something has to change there because yeah. I, I don't think it's, I don't think it, it does anybody any good for them to go throughout the season 
doing this with him. It's not good for him. It's probably not good for the club overall. They, they need a, a more permanent solution than than that. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and when I say that, you know, this is the most frustrating loss, and I, I think probably the worst loss, quote unquote, worse of the season. But again, it, it's not it's not a panic time. You know, they're still playing yeah. at like 106, 107 win clip or something like that. So yeah. like, you know, let's put the, the torches down. Um, but I understand the frustration. I was frustrated watching this tonight with my dad on my couch. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Lux, as you look, you know, as, as we sit here, 163 batting average, a 186 slugging percentage for Gavin Lux. So it hasn't been good. There's no sugarcoating it. Obviously, no. defensively, there haven't been issues at second base, which I think everyone was expecting. But we all ex also expected that the bat would be okay and that right. we carry him. And uh, again, I'm just reading the tea leaves of if Roberts doesn't trust him in that spot and wants to go to Rojas with a bat in his hand. Not defensively. Right. Like if, if Rojas comes in in the bottom half of that inning or, or the next half inning and comes in defensively and then ends up hitting in the 11th, so be it. But but to take the bat out of Lux's hands to give it to Rojas with the splits as they are uh, is a tough one. It's worth pointing out for Muncie that comment mentioned Muncie as well. I mean, Muncie's got an OPS of like 830 and, and made a couple of great plays at, at third. So yeah. I'm not sure it, it totally is fair to include Muncie in the – uh, Gavin Lux camp, especially after a night like tonight where he hits a home run. Right. And we're like 16 games into the season too. And he's got, you know, some, some high leverage home runs already, you know, this year, like I, I, I'm sticking with Max. Uh, yeah. But, you know, to, to your point about uh, Gavin and how they're handling him, I, I think you have to figure something out there because this, this, it shouldn't be this, um, you know, and, and, you know, we're looking at the comments here and look, this, this, this is still one of the best teams in Major League Baseball. Like I said, I think with this loss tonight, they're at something like 100 and maybe 103, 105 win pace right now. So, like, yeah. you know, let, let's let's temper things a bit. But, again, understanding the frustration here after a loss like tonight. Yeah, Charlie Sinclair with another super chat. We appreciate the super chats. Tatis owns Dodger <laughs> Stadium. SMH, Tatis, three for five tonight. A pair of runs, a pair of RBIs. Um, and, of course, the game-tying home run. Um, off of uh, Ryan Brazier in the seventh inning. So it, it look, if there's a guy that none of us want to see succeed in Dodger Stadium, it is Tatis, and um, and yet he continues to do it. And, and maybe the Padres just have Yoshinobu Yamamoto's number because we can get into that in a little bit. But it was a rough uh, a rough go for the Dodgers starter who struggled against the Padres in Korea, came back, had a great start in the in the middle there. And then back to struggling against the Padres. So let's get to sort of the play-by-play -play of how we got to this one. Actually, we got another super chat here. So Richard, real, and, and real quick, Jeff, I yeah. see I, I, I saw a comment or two about the 105 win comment. That's not me predicting. That's right. the math. Yeah. Uh, going into this game, they were 10 and five. I think that that was on pace for like over 105 wins. So it's probably gotten dropped down. That's that's what the math says right now, based on what their record is. Yeah, let's do the math. 101 win pace after the loss tonight. So um, a, a tad over there. Um, Richard with the comment here, middle relief showed its ugly head again. Bottom three of the lineup can't continue like this. How much longer are they going to put up with CT3? Never underestimate Dave's ability to make poor changes. Richard, I have good news for you. These are all the topics that we plan to address tonight. <laughs> the middle relief was brutal. Uh, Daniel Hudson, a guy that I, I think many of us trust, and they brought him in early simply because of who is going to be up. He doesn't get the job done, gives up a run. And then you've got Ryan Brazier, a guy who, again, I think some people felt fairly decent about. He ends up giving up three runs, uh, including the home run to Tatis that ties the game. You mentioned the bottom of the lineup. Um, the Dodgers' seven, eight, nine hitters tonight went 0 for 14. So I think that's fair. And then there's the Chris Taylor conversation. Um, we mentioned Rojas getting put in for Gavin Lux. At the same time, Kike Hernandez came in for James Outman. Chris Taylor stayed in the game uh, right in the midst of that sort of whole thing. And uh, that, that I think to me, Anthony was probably the most confusing part. Um, I, I've long said I'm an Outman guy. I don't like that. They're treating him like a platoon player this early in his career. And so in that moment, just because it's a lefty, albeit by the way, a lefty that has reverse splits, reverse so split. a lefty that's worse against lefties than he is against righties. They go to Kike Hernandez. Like, again, I think there's a world where you could explain that one. The, the thing to me is, why why pinch it for James Outman instead of Chris Taylor? James Outman hasn't been awesome this year, full disclosure, but he's got an OPS at least over 600. Chris Taylor right now is batting 031. You want to know what his slugging percentage is, Anthony? It's 031. Um, and he's striking out 50% of the time. 
you couldn't explain to me that there's not a logical argument anywhere out there, Anthony, for why it was Outman and not Taylor who got pulled from that game. And Outman's been getting the barrel to the ball lately. Yep. Uh, yep. You know, we see the two home runs that, that he had in the last few games. Uh, and he's hit some, he's made some hard, loud outs recently. Like he, it looks like he's starting to find it. And so I didn't understand that move either. And again, 100 Especially real quick on that 106 mile an hour lineup tonight line out tonight it was the um fourth hard fifth hardest hit ball by any dodger and it was in his last at bat 106 mile an hour 670 expected batting average he just hit it right to where the left fielder was standing so to your point in in the last at bat he had in this game in the sixth inning he hit a ball 106 miles an hour yeah and and making that move and then and then not making a move on chris taylor is baffling that's yeah. that seems like a bit of galaxy brain you know and we we've seen this stuff before from dave and everybody's had their frustrations with him as well um yeah. that was one i just i truly that was a head, head scratcher for sure and uh you know Here I, I think I'm real quick, let, me throw this, let me throw this comment up because um We've got Blake Williams at the stadium. Dave Roberts in a post-game interview along those lines. Chris Taylor won't play tomorrow. There was no thought about pinch hitting for Chris Taylor tonight. And see, and that's that's an issue. Yeah. Because either either there's no thought about it because you are just staunchly sticking with him, and that's a mistake, or because you managed your way in you you managed yourself into a corner with the outman move so that you couldn't make a move with Taylor, you know, and, you know, kind of maybe looking ahead and I can understand that. Then you, then again, that's another mistake. Yeah. And, you know, you cannot continue to do that when you, when you know what Taylor has been this season. And I think we're getting to a point now where you're going to start to have to ask serious questions about how much more, how many more plate appearances can you start to give this guy before you, yeah. you, you really start to consider what your options are. Yeah, I, I'm with you. The Taylor one makes no sense to me. And I, I know they believe in Taylor. I know he's a veteran guy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's just not a case to be made that James Outman's a worse offensive player than Chris Taylor, especially not Zero. right now. You can Zero. make a case James Outman's a much better defensive player too. And right. so are, are the Dodgers better off with Kike and left and James Outman in center? I, I think they probably are defensively as well. So they got worse defensively and they got dramatically worse offensively one fun fact by the way that outman lineup at 106 miles an hour there were five home runs hit in the game tonight that were uh not hit as hard as james outman's lineup so just a funny uh a funny deal there another super chat we appreciate the super chats flowing in uh we love this if we've got a super chat we're going to stop what we're doing and discuss it our good friend laura with the super chat here villains no longer rings true dodgers are beatable with this bottom <laughs> of the lineup and bullpen I, I mentioned the number um 0 for 14 from the bottom of the Dodgers lineup tonight. And, and that was with the substitutions. You've got Outman, who I mentioned was 0 for 2. Kike, 0 for 2. Um, uh, Chris Taylor, 0 for 5. Gavin Lux, 0 for 3. Miguel Rojas, 0 for 2. Uh, there was a walk in there for James Outman. Um, so 0 for 14. And, and look, it's worth pointing out. There was one Dodger who had multiple hits tonight. That was Shohei Otani, who had three extra base hits, almost a fourth. Aside from him, Anthony, the stat that, that they said on the broadcast a couple of times, it was crazy. When the Dodgers, when Teoscar Hernandez hit a home run in the third inning to give the Dodgers a 7-3 to three lead, the Dodgers went 2-28 for 28 from that point forward the yep. rest of the game. So I think the bottom of the lineup deserves to be piled on, but I do think it's also worth pointing out that the team as a whole struggled 1-12 for 12 with runners in scoring position. You had Muncie 0 for 1, Rojas 0 for 1, Teoscar 0 for 2, Kike 0 for 1, Taylor 0 for 1, Smith 0 for 2, Freeman 0 for 2. So even just right there, you've got Smith, Freeman, Teoscar, Hernandez, a combined 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position. So we could yeah. point to the 14, 0 for 14 at the bottom, but maybe, I don't know, is it fair to expand that conversation to disappointment with the entire lineup tonight? Uh, yeah, see, you can. You can, but I, I don't. I don't think that. Look, that that part of the lineup put up seven runs and yeah. you know through four or five, five innings or whatever it was, right? Um, and so, sure, they could have done. They had opportunities to do more damage after that. Uh, there's no question about that, and and they didn't come through. Um, but they're producing. Yeah. They produced th in this game. They they had a stretch where they didn't, but for the most part, they they gave that part of the order. Yeah, gave you a chance for Mookie to Oscar gave you a chance to win this game handedly, yeah, convincingly, and they they ended up losing the game. 
And yeah. so, and, and a big part of that falls on that bottom part of the lineup and it's becoming a serious problem, you know, and, and we have been, I think along with Blake have been sort of voices of reason and like, look, it's, you know, it's 10 games, it's 12 games, you know, now we're at, I think 16 games or whatever it is. Um, and, but, but I think it's been, it's been bad enough now that, you know, you have to start considering what can be done here yeah. to improve that part of the, the order because it, it is hurting them. Uh, yeah. I don't, I wouldn't say it's killing them. Cause again, you just called that they're still on 101 win pace, but you cannot, that can't sustain itself for, for too long because it is going to start to hurt you more and more. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, the, the, that Mookie to, to Oscar part of the order, my one through six, you know, they, they had opportunities to do more damage and probably put this game away for yeah. good. Um, but without those guys, they don't, they don't have that four run lead to begin with. Yeah. I've long said five is the number. If the offense scores more than five runs and it's on pitching, I think yeah. you can amend that a little bit when you go into the 11th inning, <laughs> when, when, when your relief pitcher gets you out of the top half of the 10th inning without a run, I think the offense deserves. I thought blame. the game was over. I thought yeah. the game was over there. Yeah. And even going back, I'm just looking through um, the bottom of the seventh inning. They have Otani with a one out double. Freddie Freeman can't get the job done. Will Smith intentionally walked. And then you had the Max Muncy strikeout. I believe that was on three pitches. Um, bottom of the lineup in the eighth, no problems. Bets, Otani, and Freeman 0 for 3 in the bottom of the ninth. Then you've got the bottom of the tenth with the runner on second. Again, Will Smith moves the runner over, but can't get a hit. I mean, I want to give my guy Will Smith credit there for moving him over, but a hit, a hit wins the game. He doesn't get that. Muncy walked. Hernandez, an awful looking three pitch strikeout. Kike flies out. And then the bottom of the 11th, um, foul out, ground out, fly out, and uh, and the game's over. So I tough think, one, tough one for the offense tonight. And I think, I think what made it worse was that, and, and Laura's right, like they look like a beatable team right now. Yeah. Once you can get, like, if you can get through their starting pitcher, they yeah. feel like a beatable team. You, because then you, you feel like you can score with them to a certain yeah. extent. Um, but, you know, I, I think that um, I, I think a lot of the frustration and and why there's such a microscope and like it's it really seems to 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 have a, a bright light on it right now is that there were some really bad at bats in there. It wasn't like their guys like you. But all right, nah, that was a good at bat CT. You know, you get them next time. They were yeah. there were some ugly at bats, and you know, yeah. and not to keep singling singling out Chris Taylor, but. Stop falling behind 0 and 2 every yeah. time you step up to the box. Yeah. Yeah. 0 for 5 with three strikeouts for Taylor tonight. We got more super chats, so let's get to these. Uh, Jason throwing some Canadian dollars our way. We appreciate that. Not sure what the exchange rate is, but either way, you know, we appreciate that. We'll go get some poutine next time we're up with our Canadian dollars. He said, You grade a manager directly on pen usage. Doc is failing here. Th this is an interesting one, Anthony. Um, I, I want to blame, I, I blame Dave for the Chris Taylor decision to stay in for taking Outman out, for taking Lux out. I, I don't know what Dave was supposed to do tonight. I mean, he went to Hudson for the best part of the lineup. He can't get it done. Two hits, gives up a run. Then he goes to Brazier, who, I mean, if we're ranking guys we trust in the Dodgers bullpen, is definitely closer to guys I trust than he is guys I don't trust. He gets rocked. Um, two hits and a walk. All three of those guys come in to score. Again, the Tatis home run. Joe Kelly... I trust less than Brazier based on the, what I've seen from him so far. Um, but he gets the job done. Evan Phillips obviously gets the job done. Yarbrough. I mean, like the only complaint I think I have is maybe why didn't Yarbrough go back out for a second inning? But look, yeah. I know Alex Vesey is not a popular guy. Okay. Like this is, I know people aren't going to like what I'm about to say. When a relief pitcher comes in, he had an O2 count with two outs. He, he, we nearly got out of a situation. Yes. The run scored. The guy started on second base. That's not on the relief pitcher who comes in if that yeah. run comes along to score. Now, he threw two terrible, terrible fastballs, 0-2, uh, to uh, Jackson Merrill, who ended up with the game-winning hit. So if you want to question Vessia, I, I get it. That's the, But that, to me, is the only one you could possibly question. And even then, Vessia did better than any of us expected. He nearly got out of that. So I, I don't know if the pen usage is what I would I would be mad at Dave for. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Jason's right. For the most part, managers are graded on how they manage the bullpen, especially now with the DH in both leagues. Yeah. Uh, that's very true. So in, as a, when I was a beat writer full time, you know, we would. The manager would be directly responsible 
let's say in the American League because the DH wasn't in the National League yet, but um, um, the manager would be directly responsible for anywhere between like five and eight wins or losses a season. It, it wasn't a lot. Yeah. But if you mismanage your bullpen consistently enough, that number starts to jump between like 12 and 15. And then you're talking about the difference between winning in division or missing yeah. the playoffs, things like that. Right. Um, but I and- think Anthony, if I could not to cut you off, but like, I, I guess my point is it's, people are going to say Dave mismanaged it. I just don't think he has good options out there right now. Like I think he went to the guys that were his best options. And so I blame the bullpen. I think you can blame the bullpen without blaming Dave. Correct. And, and that's, and that's kind of where I was going. You, you definitely uh, led me in that direction. Yeah. He's, um, he right now is trying to kind of piece this thing together yeah. with, uh, with, with some guys who probably wouldn't be on the big league roster if everybody were healthy. Yeah. Right. Um, with that said, Vesia probably is a big league, big league pitcher, and he did almost get out of that. But when you're ahead, oh, two, there's really no excuse for leaving those pitches where he left them. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and so, Brutal. yes, you know, you only give up the one run and, and you know, the guy starts on second base. So that's not totally on him. But then again, you cannot put the ball where he was putting it and expect to survive. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think Dave Roberts, there's a few things that he did wrong tonight. I think number one is the Kike Hernandez for Outman decision, leaving Chris Taylor in the second decision, and Gavin Lux getting taken out of the game when he did. And I would put those kind of – Chris Taylor staying in the game I think is the biggest mistake. I joked in his private group chat. I said, if Taylor Trammell pinch it for Chris Taylor, would you be mad at this point? And the answer was yes, there would still be some anger. But – I think the joke is funny because it's fairly true where you're like, ah, I don't know Would I hate that. You know, yeah, um, there's a, there's uh, a premise there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, again, I mean, I see people in the chat, like part of the, the other part of this too, which we can talk about in a little bit is Yamamoto didn't do his manager any favors tonight either. Only getting five innings. Um, he throws 91 pitches and can't get into the sixth. Now, you know, if he could be a little more efficient on the front end, maybe it doesn't force the Dodgers to go to the bullpen when they actually did. Um, let's get to a couple more super chats here. Um, LTTE Beaches, $20 super chat. Thank you so much. We appreciate this. MMA voice, we're going to come back to yours. But he said, I'm ready for Pajes. He's better than Taylor and Kike already. I love the show, Blake Rocks. Um, look, Chris Taylor's not going anywhere, at, at least for the time being. Um, I mean, maybe a phantom I else did at some point, but I don't think the Dodgers are anywhere near cutting bait here. I think Taylor Trammell being on the roster is an interesting decision. I think it's because they don't want a guy like Pajes or even Vargas to come up and just sit on the bench. Tramel doesn't play. Um, but Taylor's playing. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and you know, that you make, you make a fair point there. Like you don't want to bring a guy up who's a prospect who you think could contribute for you this season and have him sit on the bench. But Taylor's playing. Yeah, that's fair. That's a good point. Yeah, because because why not? I mean, would it be Pajes? Would it be Vargas? Vargas is absolutely torching. Um, he's a guy that most people believed prior to spring training to believe to be much closer to. I mean, obviously he was already at the major league level last year. Pajes has never been a had never been a dub, above double A. Was coming off shoulder surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Pajes tore it up at spring training. Both guys. Um, I, I believe I haven't checked Pajes' numbers lately, but I know Vargas is destroying the ball down at Triple A. So, um, would that be the move? Sort of DFA Taylor Trammell and then replace him with Vargas or Pajes and, and let that guy get all those Chris Taylor at bats? I think at this point, yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah. Um, it's gotten bad enough with Taylor and, and other guys at the bottom of the lineup that you, you're you trying to inject some life there. Yeah. And between Pajes and, and Vargas, uh, I think Vargas is the first option just because yeah. he's been here. Um, yeah. and, and you want to give him another opportunity. Uh, and I so I think that would be the logical move. Yeah, um, we talked about last time kind of leaving him there and and letting him really, you know, continue to, to thrive and flourish at in Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, and then you'll pull him up when you need him. I didn't think the knee would be this soon after that conversation, but it feels like it's here. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's a fair question. And again, thank you for the super chat there. We do have one more super chat here, I believe. A couple more, actually. Uh, where does Doc's what does Doc's scorecard look like tonight? MMA voice asked this. This is something we talked about. Um, leaving Chris Taylor in F decision, as far as I'm concerned, uh, taking James Outman out for Kike Hernandez. Again, in a vacuum, 
Maybe I can understand that one. I don't think it's crazy as much as I like Outman. I understand, you know, wanting to get Kike in against the lefty. To me, it's in combination with the Taylor one. Like, if you want Kike in against a lefty, that's fine. Take out Chris Taylor, not James Outman, especially if it's a lefty that has reverse splits. Um, and, and then again, I think the Rojas versus Lux decision is not like an F minus type decision because of the splits, because of all that, because of the defense. I think there's there's ways to explain it. I, I don't like it, but I, I at least like. I'm not going to say it's the worst decision I've ever seen. Um, but again, I just keep coming back to, I, I don't know what Dave Roberts could have done short of Ryan Yarbrough coming back out for a second inning. Uh, other than that, I'm not sure what, what else like I would have done. So I, I think the first two or three I mentioned are bad enough to make me frustrated after a loss tonight, but um, this wasn't the worst Dave Roberts performance we've ever seen. No, definitely not. We've seen worse. Um, and, and, you know, the bullpen stuff, uh, like we've mentioned, not to continue to beat on this thing, but uh, he's working with what he has right yeah. now. Uh, you know, he's 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 he doesn't have great options, period, right now because of the injuries. And so, you know, he's he's putting guys in in decent situations. Uh, I, I was a little con I, you know, I, I, I said to somebody that I was watching the game with, I said, well, I, I Yarborough might have the next three innings here. Yeah. You know, let's let's kind of see what this looks like. And he only pitched one, um, you know, but he's he's putting the guys out there that he has and and they're just not always performing. Yeah. Um, Fabian Ardaya, um, I guess I should say people that are in the clubhouse tweeting Ryan Yarbrough only available for one inning tonight. Dave Roberts said they're planning on deploying him bulk innings in the next series against the Nationals. So there you go. Yeah. So if that's the case, I don't think there's anything bullpen wise that you could complain about as far as what Dave Roberts did tonight. Yeah. Um. We got another super chat here from Jason. Got us the other halfway towards our poutine with some Canadian dollars here. Get us some Tim Hortons as well. Uh, he says flying to California tomorrow, so it's Canadian money in the chat. I assume CA there is uh, referring to California. That that could be Canada, but based on logic here, <laughs> I'm guessing he's headed to California, and uh, that's why we're getting Canadian money. So Jason, we appreciate that as well. Let's get to a quick recap of just how we got to where we got to in this game. Thank you to everybody joining us. Almost 1400 people here at 11 PM West coast. We appreciate you. Normally these games, the new rule changes, we're doing post game shows at like nine 30 PM. It was back to old times where yeah. we got the three plus hour game, uh, 10 30 PM live post game shows. So thank you to the 1400 folks joining us live. Um, again, Dodgers put themselves in a hole. Yoshinobu Yamamoto continues to struggle against the Padres, a two run home run to Manny Machado right in the first inning and the Dodgers dig themselves a hole immediately. And it felt like one of those games where you're like, all right, is this really what we're doing? Yamamoto just can't beat the Padres. Fortunately, he gets out of the first inning, makes it into the second tonight. Otani gets a home run back, ties Hideki Matsui for the most home runs by a Japanese player in major league baseball. It's two to one in the bottom of the first. However, Yamamoto gives one right back in the bottom of the, in the top of the second, uh, Hassan Kim, homers to make it a three to one lead. But this is when the Dodgers start the comeback. Max Muncy, a home run, a, a laser down the right field line, followed by a Mookie Betts three run home run that makes it five to Dodgers. Teoscar Hernandez tacks on a two run home run in the bottom of the third. All of a sudden it's seven to three. Yamamoto has settled down and you're starting to feel like the Dodgers offense is humming seven runs, three innings. We're good. Again, and he was rolling at that point. It's just the totally this it, it's April and his pitch count got to 90. And that was yeah. that like, if, yeah, if this is a month from now, he probably goes out, finishes the six, and he has a quality start. I, you know, I see some, some people in the chat saying, you know, kind of big time criticisms of Yamamoto. He made two or three bad pitches. The home run that Machado hit wasn't even really a bad pitch. It just caught too yeah. much of the zone, I thought. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't a terrible pitch. But I mean, I think he retired like something like 12 of the last 13 he faced, or it was something in that neighborhood. Yeah. Um, he was rolling. And, and it was just because it's an April pitch count thing that he didn't go out for the six and get that quality start. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, I thought, I thought he was good. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, so again, Dodgers seven to three through three innings, Cronenworth gets one back seven to four in the sixth. That was off of Daniel Hudson. And then Brazier comes in and things fall apart. They get the RBI ground out where it looks like maybe Muncie has a play at home to potentially get Xander Bogarts ultimately doesn't matter. Cause even if he makes the play at home and gets the guy out, <laughs> Tatis, it's a three run home run instead of a two run home run in the next batter, but it's seven to seven after the seventh. Um, and then we go to extras. And again, you get to the top of the 10th. They've got the runner on second base and Ryan Yarbrough's on the mound for the Dodgers. And, and you're basically thinking best case scenario, they only get one, you know, small chance they get out of this with zero, but like, let's limit it to one. 
and, and let the Dodgers line up, eat a little bit and see what happens. Well, Yarborough actually does better than that. He gets out of it with a zero on the board. And as we both talked about already, if you get a zero in the top of the 10th inning, you have got to, got to, got to capitalize in the bottom. Will Smith leads off that inning. Again, long fly ball to center field, moves Freddie Freeman up to third. That's the moment where I was like, yeah, man, I want Will Smith to cash that one in because I don't feel yeah. great about the guys that are coming up behind. They walk Max Muncy, and I couldn't believe um, that they didn't walk Teoscar Hernandez there also to continue getting to the bottom of the lineup. I guess it ends up working out for them because the Dodgers lineup just can't cash it in. And then again, Alex Vesey gets two outs and two strikes in the top of the 11th before Jackson Merrill slaps a single into left field. And that was all she wrote. Dodgers lose eight to seven. So that's how we got here. Again, if you want to look at the box score, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, five innings, four hits, one walk, three runs, six strikeouts from him. Did give up two home runs. Again, Hudson and Brazier give up four combined in the sixth and seventh. On the other side, Michael King for the Padres. This guy gave up seven runs in the first three. He ends up getting them five innings, five innings, six hits, two walks, four strikeouts seven runs, just four of them earned. Cause it is worth pointing out that right before Mookie Betts hit the home run, Gavin Lux reached on an error. So the Dodgers did have a little bit of fortune there um, on the offensive side of things. Shohei Otani three for five with three extra base hits. Again, could have been four, if not for a great play by Jackson Merrill, who's probably the player of this game. No yeah. other Dodger has more than two, uh, one hit Mookie, uh, Freddie Freeman, Max Muncy, Teoscar Hernandez each had one hit. Everybody else had zero on the Padre side. Tatis, three for five with a home run, two runs, two RBIs. Jackson Merrill, two for four as well. So um, that, that's kind of how we got to where we got to. I see we have another super chat here from Hawaiian Kira, so we'll get to this. She says, who's the leader in the bullpen? Seems like there's a lack of something out there. Um, I understand the the sort of the sentiment here, I think, Anthony, that it, it the, the Dodgers bullpen just isn't clicking on all cylinders. I guess... The only pushback I would have to to it potentially being a leadership issue is on a night like tonight, it was Daniel Hudson and Ryan Brazier who couldn't get it done. These are two veteran guys that have been around for a long time. It's not, you know, the Kyle Hurts or the Alex Vessias of the world. It's guys that should be self-motivated, guys that probably are the, the, the voices of leadership out there. And they're the ones on a night like tonight that couldn't get it done. Yeah, and I, I, I think I, I get what Kira is saying here. Um, that's there, there's no stability there because I think aside from Phillips, there's no defined roles right now with the bullpen. It's yeah. it's kind of just like I said earlier, he's sort of piecing this thing together. And I get it like sometimes and especially in the age of analytics, you want to piece together matchups and especially with the also the, the three batter rule and things like that. Um, yeah. That plays into it a little bit. But there's no like. We know this guy has the seventh. We know this guy has the eighth. And then we know that he's giving the ball to Phillips. Yeah. There is, there's none of that with the Dodgers. Essentially right now, the only real role, even though they won't kind of call it that for some stupid reason, yeah. is Phillips in the ninth or, or Phillips as the closer. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, and, and Yarborough maybe as the long man, but yeah. beyond that, like you, you don't, there's no, def, there's no definition of, in the roles. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've talked about before, like these guys are creatures of habit and they really do like to know um, sort of where they slot into things. And I think that when you talk about leadership in the bullpen, I think that's a big part of it is like guys aren't always certain, like, you know, because guys in the, the relievers start to look at like in the fourth inning, how the game's starting to play out yeah. and they're starting to go, OK, this is where I might come in or you know, it's, it's, they play that kind of game in their own minds. Um, yeah. And when you don't know exactly what your role is uh, or exactly when you might be coming in, you, it, it's harder to, to do that for them. And maybe, you know, it, it, they're still professionals and, you know, you can't leave yeah. a no two fastball in the middle of the zone to get tagged by the, uh, one of the top prospects in the game. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it's, they're not making it easier. Let's, yeah. let's, let's say that. And I think Daniel Hudson's the perfect example because you're talking about roles and I think it's a super helpful conversation to have and, and a great reminder by you of like how these guys are thinking about things. I, I think Daniel Hudson, at least ba based on how today played out, it feels like he's another guy who has sort of, he, he's one step below Evan Phillips. And the reason I say that is because he came in because it was one time when they knew for sure they were going to face the heart of the Padres order. But think about Daniel Hudson. He's not thinking about coming into the sixth inning of this game. You know, right. he's thinking I'm going to get the middle of the lineup at some point. 
but he's thinking seventh inning, eighth inning, you know, that sort of a situation. So for him to have to start warming in the fifth to come in in the sixth, I think is the perfect example of that's not an excuse. That's not a reason to say, Oh, well, who cares? It's not really his fault then that he gave up a run, but I just think it goes to show you kind of the flux that this group could possibly be in. And the way that that could come back to bite a team like the Dodgers on a night when, you know, every little bit ended up being kind of the difference between this one going the right direction or go in the wrong direction. Um, a, a couple more bullet points. Again, we talked about this bottom of the Dodgers order goes 0 for 14 tonight. Um, Hudson and Brazier four runs allowed by those two guys as the bullpen continues to struggle. We talked about the decision to take out James Outman, leave Chris Taylor in Gavin Lux. Um, before we kind of move past this game and into a couple other Dodgers stories from today, as well as taking some questions, Anthony, anything else on here that, that you feel like, we've missed we we haven't talked about it could be yoshinobu yamamoto anybody else in the lineup that you want to touch on um just just you know to reiterate that you know i thought yamamoto looked pretty good uh he yeah. got he got sort of blitzed on a couple of those uh, on, on those home runs um also let's stop giving other teams players plaques when they've hit a absolutely massive bomb against our own team yeah uh, that'd be nice if tatis did not have a plaque at dodger stadium <laughs> yeah uh I think I think that's just stupid. But uh, I, I thought Yamamoto was fine. Um, you know, it was a pitch count thing, or else he probably goes six. Uh, and and that's that's not on him. That's you know that's kind of the the rules of the road for what the organization is doing with him. Um, you touched on something else that I think could end up being big in the next two games is that King, after he got pummeled, was able yeah. to give them a couple more innings when you when you sort of thought his night was over and yeah. save the bullpen a couple of innings and that's the difference between a guy being available on sunday or not and and yeah. that could be that could be a big situation uh later on in the weekend yeah just looking at at sort of the yamamoto night you mentioned it so the first inning he gets a strikeout single strikeout homer strikeout so he ends up getting three strikeouts in that first first batter he faces in the top of the second is ha sung kim who ends up hitting the home run from there, it goes ground out, fly out, ground out, out of the inning, line out, single, double play, out of the inning, strike out, walk, pop out, fly out, out of the inning, ground out, strike out, strike out. So to your point, didn't give up. I believe he gave up one hit um, and one walk from in his last across the last four innings, basically, that he pitched today. So nice to see him settle down, especially against the team that he struggled against obviously in yeah. Korea. And then uh, it looked like he was struggling again. Nice to see him settle down. But to your point, I mean, again, I said it before, like if that first inning's a little bit smoother, it, does he maybe come out of the fifth with like 80 pitches and they're able to get one more inning out of him in the sixth. And then all of a sudden this struggling yeah. bullpen that doesn't have arms, everybody gets bumped back. Then Daniel Hudson doesn't have to come in in the sixth. In fact, he probably doesn't come in in the sixth at all or the seventh because then you've got your bullpen kind of set up the way that you want with Brazier, Hudson, Phillips to close it out. So a lot of what ifs for the Dodgers, but that's an interesting one. Yeah, um, we and we're, we're seeing that his stuff, his stuff plays. Yeah, I mean it's it's nasty. Guys yeah. are guys look completely lost when they fall behind, and then that splitter comes. So yeah. he's got the plus plus stuff that that was advertised with him. Yeah, super chat here from Laura. She says, "Do we have an update on Bueller hit by a comebacker?" on his hand. Yes, Laura, let's get into that. Cause that's one of the biggest storylines for the Dodgers um, today. If you missed the news, Walker Bueller, as we've mentioned, had a rehab appearance today. He was scheduled to go, I believe 80 to 90 pitches was the goal for what they wanted to get out of him. He was starting at Rancho Cucamonga just to be a little bit closer. Unfortunately, um, he gets hit by a comebacker that bounces off his pitching hand he kind of shakes it off you could tell he's in pain when the time at the time of the comebacker he ends up finishing the inning but that's that i think he made 27 total pitches um dave roberts gave the update after he left the rehab start for precautionary reasons he doesn't think the injury is serious after taking a comebacker off his hand um again bueller did finish the inning so that was the news on walker bueller there was a picture i saw that he had something taped up on his hand as he was leaving Anthony, it's just a brutal bit of news for a guy that it feels like things are starting to happen. It feels like there's some positive momentum and to have something fluky like this happen in a rehab appearance. Just, I feel for the guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that they're calling it precautionary and that's kind of what I figured when, when he came out. Um, 
hopefully it's nothing more than that. I think yeah. what this does, though, is it keeps him down for one more start. Uh, yeah. You know, regardless of when that would have been, maybe he would have started there again or somewhere in the minors again. But I think whatever whatever the case is, it extends that timeline probably by another start, um, which, you know, fine. Uh, yeah. You know, they're they're going to get by fine without him. And and um, you you want to make sure he's built up. You know, you don't want him to come in. He can only give you four innings for the first couple of outings. Right. Like you. Yeah. You would like to see him built up a bit and, and you know, him doing it down there is fine, um, but scary because I think the Dodgers are counting on that guy being a front end piece of that rotation. Um, and along with Glass now, probably leading them, you know, assuming everybody is is fine into October. Yeah. And it's an interesting conversation because originally you'd say, hey, between Glass now, Yamamoto, Bobby Miller, hey, Walker, we just need you to slot in when you come back in that 4-5 range type of a situation. Obviously, Yamamoto now, another start, start that wasn't terrible but wasn't dominant like maybe you'd expect. Bobby Miller didn't have his best outing last time. And so I'm not saying there's more pressure on Walker Buehler. I don't think any of that would affect him anyways. But it's just interesting that the situation that the Dodgers are in. Um, a, a quick note because you mentioned this. The plan was that Buehler would pitch tonight for Rancho Dave Roberts had said beforehand he would make one more rehab outing on Thursday. Again, with the goal that he was going to get up to 80 to 90 pitches. He did not. And so the goal was make one more rehab outing Thursday, and then they'll make a decision. Um, I think you you make a great point. I think hopefully he can pitch again on Thursday, keep that normal rhythm. But then whether it's at Rancho, whether it's at Oklahoma City, then you want to see him get up to 80 to 90 pitches. Then you probably have one more rehab start after that. And then we're talking about, where does all this sit? So now, whereas maybe we were a week, week and a half away, now we're probably two and a half weeks away from Walker Bueller making his return. Again, rehab appearance in the second inning, had a ground ball comebacker that bounced off of his pitching hand, and he stayed in, finished the inning, but was removed after that, not able to get to the 80 to 90 pitches. Dave Roberts did say precautionary his removal. If you want to believe Dave Roberts on an injury update, especially about a guy that wasn't even pitching at Dodger Stadium, uh, more power to you, I guess. Least, say. I'm not saying it's worse. I'm just saying I'm not like taking a sigh of relief because Dave Roberts said that tonight it was precautionary. I'm just, you know, it, at least they're not the Lakers training staff or injury update yeah. people. Uh, but I, I think it's a very positive sign that he was allowed to finish that inning and get out of it and then got taken out. Yeah. If they thought it was something serious, there's no way he would have thrown another ball. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. So, Laura, thank you for the super chat, by the way, and asking that question about Walker Bueller. Uh, we got another super chat here from Richard Flores. Bad middle relief puts pressure on every aspect of the game. Everything must be perfect. I think that's well said, Richard. And he said CT3 needs a phantom IL vacation. Um, this is, you know, we mentioned this earlier. I think his strikeout rate is something like 50% this year. 0 for 5 with three strikeouts tonight. Um, you know, his last at bat, he didn't strike out, but you know, he popped out in foul territory, like wasn't even close to making hard contact or putting the ball in play in a meaningful way either. Um, Oh, what'd I say? Oh, 31, I believe is his batting average. Oh, 37, something like that. Oh, 31 yeah. is his batting average. Oh, 31 is his slugging percentage. So I'm with you. Send him to the IL, give him a couple of weeks, let him take some reps in the cage. It's not, it's not good for him. It's not good for anybody for him to be at the major league level and doing what he's doing. Yeah. The margin of error with, with the relievers is, is something real. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that's what I made the comment earlier in the show about, you know, can you trust these guys? And, you know, I just, right now you can't because of what Richard is saying. He's exactly right. Uh, I agree a hundred percent. And the CT three thing is like, look, when Altman was, was struggling earlier, he was putting together some pretty decent at bats Yeah. right now. Taylor is he, I mean, he's overmatched from the time he steps into the box to the time he makes an out, he's yeah. falling behind consistently. Um, and pitchers are just challenging him with fastballs middle, middle, and he's fouling them off. Yeah. And you yeah. know, that's, that's, that's not a good sign. I mean, if you're getting those kinds of pitches, I mean, those are, those are slump buster kind of pitches and he's missing them. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I've said this before about Taylor and it's not like necessarily entire, entirely his fault. When Chris Taylor looks bad, it just looks worse. Like, like everybody has slumps. Chris Taylor's slumps hit, look worse because of his swing, because different. of the mechanics. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like, oh, he's down way worse than, than everybody else necessarily, but 
regardless of if he is or isn't, it looks worse because of the way it swings. It's also worth pointing out for Chris Taylor that we're not overreacting to a sample size of, you know, 37 plate appearances. This is a guy who last year, um, you know, sort of was, was up and down. I mean, he ends the season as a positive offensive player, but there were low moments last year that were brutal. And so maybe 2023 is the medicine we need to take and just remind ourselves as bad as it looked at times with Taylor last year, he ends up finishing the year with a 104 weighted runs created plus. Like maybe yeah. that's the, hey, take a deep breath. We've seen the lows, but man, it, it, again, I just don't see the benefit for him, for the Dodgers, for anybody of them continuing to do what they're currently doing. Not when you have other options yeah. that, you know, that that people are already wondering about before Taylor even, you know, had this slump. Yeah. Um, you know, and the other thing is that you're, you're right. He's, he's an, he's, he's probably the streakiest player on the roster. Yeah. Um, and, and when he's bad, he's bad. And then he'll go, you know, on a 10 day stretch where he'll hit 450 or something like that. Like he's, yeah. you know, it, that's, that's kind of who he is. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, I think it's a great point. Um, as well. We got another super chat here. This is a, a more fun one. I would say Noah Ortega. Thanks for the therapy. Otana keeps shooing. <laughs> Showing, showing, probably the inter the, the translation there, the pronunciation there. Um, three extra base hits for Otani, a home run and two doubles. I've said it multiple times. Jackson Merrill makes a diving catch in the left center field gap. Otherwise, this is four for five with three doubles and a home run. Um, to say this guy is dialed in, I think it was um Sarah Langs who tweeted that like of of all of Otani's years. Let me see if I could find it. Um, here we go. Otani already has two unanimous MVPs and is off to his best start through 16 games as a hitter. His 15 extra base hits most in his career through 16 games, 24 hits most, batting average 353 best, runs 13 most, 48 total bases most, 392 on base most, 706 slugging most, OPS of 1100 the most. So it basically every offensive category, a guy who's won the MVP twice unanimously is having the best offensive season of his career to start uh, a 16 game stretch. So <laughs> incredible yeah. stuff. From you, you know, uh, the, I know. So there's, there are fans who are upset with Friedman for not filling out the bullpen or, you know, because Lux isn't hitting well or Taylor's not hitting well. And, you know, yeah. it's, it, the front office is going to get some heat, but you look at the, the, long-term contracts because remember the Dodgers were not a long-term contract yeah. kind of front office and they had right. always said we will give it to the guys when we know who they are yeah. and they've given them to Mookie yeah Freddie Freeman Shohei Otani Yamamoto and Tyler Glass now yeah and, and now Will Smith point, and, to, and and now it's Will Smith and to 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 the to the they they deserve some credit here because yeah. Right. Every single one of those guys is hitting, and when right. not, I don't mean like hitting. I mean they've hit. Yeah, They're, they are doing what they've been signed to do. Glass yeah. now is a legitimate ace. Yeah. Yamamoto looks like a front end type of rotation arm, yeah. uh, and and Muki, Otani, and Freeman might finish all top five in the National League MVP voting. Yeah, no, it's a great point that it, that we're sitting here complaining about some of the things we wish they would have done or guys that are underperforming. Let's just remember that the reason that this game was in extra innings is because they went out and signed Shohei Otani, Yamamoto, the starter tonight, Will Smith, who got extended, Mookie Betts, who hit the home run, Teoscar Hernandez, who was a free agent signing, hits a home run, Max Muncy, who was extended, hit the home run. Like these were all decisions that the front office made that did benefit, obviously, the Dodgers tonight. Um, speaking of Otani, let's talk real quick, just the storyline with him. Um, he was asked, obviously, Ipe Mizahara, his former interpreter, um, was brought into court today um, and did not enter a plea, but apologized to some degree. Otani had this statement to the LA Times in Japanese. He said, um, I'm very grateful for the Department of Justice's investigation. For me personally, this marks a break from this, and I'd like to focus on baseball. Um, so again, the good news here is all evidence pointing towards Otani was purely a victim, had nothing to do with this, did not make payments on behalf of his friend, none of that. And, and it also seems like Mizahara is taking responsibility and is cooperating to some degree in the investigation, um, which would all be a good sign for the Dodgers for Otani. He, he was not available to make uh, a comment or to be asked questions before the game, or I believe after the game, as far as I've seen so far. But again, this is the statement, just grateful. Um, and that he's, you know, this marks a break from this and, and hopefully we can just focus on baseball. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, the, the news over the last couple of days, um, you know, kind of puts Shohei in the clear. Yeah. Anybody else who still has conspiracy theories about him being involved or knowing or yeah, doesn't understand how he couldn't have, have known that the money was coming out of his account later for that. Yeah. You know, miss me. Uh, the, yeah. the, Take off you know, your Padres hat. Take off your Braves hat. Reveal the tinfoil that you've got underneath it and uh, yeah. keep it moving. Yeah, I mean, I you know, it's it's not a difficult read, and it's pretty interesting. It's thirty five ish pages or whatever. Read the thing because it answers every question and and every you know quote unquote hole in Otani's story that you might have thought were, were yeah. existed. Yeah, I think it's a great point, and it does look like Otani spoke to uh, to reporters post game. But again, I don't believe he was answering any questions on this. Um, I, I see just a tagline about him talking about tying Matsui's record for the most home runs among Japanese born players uh, and just specifics for the game. So um, stay tuned to the Dodger Blue YouTube page. Again, Blake, we've got a credentialed guy there at Dodger Stadium who's getting all sorts of video from this. And so he'll have video of that Otani interview um, and post game press conference, I guess, if you want to call it that, uh, up on the Dodger Blue YouTube page. So make sure you guys check that out. Um, let's get to some questions from some folks before we close this out again, um, 1130 PM nearly. So we've got five or six more minutes. We'll take some questions. Um, and perfect. We've got a food question to mix this up. David wants to know, um, what is Anthony, the Paisan with favorite Italian dish? <laughs> David, I know you've asked this question a couple once or twice before. So our apologies for not getting to it sooner. Uh, you know, I, I think on the first show I ever did, uh, during spring training, you know, my favorite food uh, that that came up and, and you know, pasta was on it for sure. Uh, look, I, I I like a, if I'm just being, you know, if I'm being simple, let's get to it. I like a nice bowl of spaghetti with red sauce and there's got to be some, some chili in it. Okay. Uh, you know, whether that's flakes or, or it's in the sauce, you know, there's some kind of spice. It's got to, it's got to make me sweat a little bit. Okay. Um, that's a go-to for me. I, I, I think I said like, you know, my, my last meals are a nice steak, uh, some street tacos and a, you know, a big hefty bowl of, of spaghetti with some spicy red sauce. There's not much you could do to go wrong in the Italian foods group. If you're asking me, I mean, yeah. um, from noodles, obviously you, you could hit me with that. You want to give me a red sauce. You want to give me a white sauce. You want to give me a green sauce. You want to give me a cream sauce. You want to give me an olive oil and garlic sauce. I'll take all of it. I'll take some chicken Parmesan as well. I mean, you could, you could hit me with anything in the Italian food groups. And uh, I think I'm interested. <laughs> you, it's, it, it's hard to miss, man. It's hard, hard to, to miss. miss. Um, let's get to some more questions. Uh, Hawaiian Kier wants to know, is the next Shohei Homer ball a milestone? If you were paying attention closely yeah. on Sportsnet LA, they were talking about how they had some marked baseballs that they were using to pitch to Otani because it would be him breaking the record for the most home runs hit by a Japanese born player. So I just thought Anthony, that that storyline was hilarious because they gave the special balls to the pitcher and Joe Davis, they were making a joke. They're like, Hey bud, just in case you give up a home run to this guy, we just want you to know that like, we're going to, we're going to need to have this ball authenticated ahead of time. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, it is, you know, I, I, I can't think I, how, how long did, did Matsui play for the Yankees? How long, how long was he in the major leagues? Um, Let's see. We can look that because up. Because it seems like he was he was up for much longer than Otani has been. And Otani is about to pass him, hopefully yeah. tomorrow. Um, just she, I, I'll say this. Otani, uh, you know, the Japanese home run record aside in the big leagues. He for for having the, the biggest contract ever in North American professional sports. Somehow he's living up to it right now. Yeah. I mean, uh, it was about 10, 10 seasons, by the yet. way, 10 seasons, Matsui was in the major leagues. Um, a, a couple of those were, you know, cut short by injury, I would say. Yeah. And again, he wasn't like a, a prolific. He had one year of 31 home runs, had a couple like four, four in the 20. So he, he wasn't, yeah. you know, a 40 home run guy, but he definitely, to your point, it was more of a slow and steady wins the race for Matsui right. than Otani coming out and hitting 40 bombs a year. He's just, he's, he is, uh, no pun intended. He is Showtime. Like he, he's can't yes. miss. Like when Alex Rodriguez played for the Rangers and the Mariners, like that was sort of appointment television to watch his plate appearances. Otani's yeah. in that sort of realm right now. Yeah, 
yeah, I think it's fair. Edarico with a couple of questions. Opinions on Montgomery letting go of Scott Boris. That one's amazing. I love yeah. it. Scott Boris told all of his guys, you're going to get 5X what they ended up getting. So shout out to him for saying, kick rock, Scott Boris. I don't want you touching my next contract negotiation <laughs> a year from now. Uh, his second question here, doesn't the investigation on Ipe Mizahara um, feel like it went a bit too fast? My read on this, Edarico, is when you read that report, Sometimes things can go fast if they're very, very clear. If, if you if Ipe is part is um, helping and participating and being cooperative, and they have the text messages that they do from him. Keep in mind the investigation to the bookmaker has been going on for longer, and so yes. a lot of this evidence against Ipe would have been collected in that investigation. The fact that Shohei was cooperative, the fact that everybody was just willing to cooperate, and things were as obvious and blatant and on the surface as they were combined with all the betting records they've been combing through. It, it feels like for weeks, if not months. So that that's my read on it. Anthony, is that the same way sort of you would answer the, doesn't this feel like it went too quickly? Yeah. The we're basing this on the timeline that we knew that this was a thing. Yeah. There was, there's a, there's a timeline that exists right. that started long before uh, that ESPN story broke. Yeah. And so when that federal investigation was going on against the bookmaker, Mizuhara's information was already being sorted through. He was already part of this. Now, the part they didn't know was that he was stealing from Otani. That yeah. came, that comes later, right? But it, but also, before Otani even speaks, when he gives that statement and he says he's a victim of theft, yeah, this investigation's the it's already on. It's already on because he's already talked to the federal authorities and he said that in that statement. So I think we're we're basing this timeline just on our own knowledge of this situation. Yeah. Also, things go faster when you have people who are cooperating and going, here you go. Yeah. Those investigations that take months and months, like this one against the bookmaker, are when people are fighting it and trying to hide things and don't want you to know stuff. Mizuhara was like, I'm busted. Here's everything. Here's yeah. my phone. Here's my computer. I, I want to get this over with and I don't want to be in prison for 30 years. And yeah. so when you have people going about this that way, these things happen quickly. Yeah. I think it's a good point. Uh, Corbin wants to know for next year on days Otani pitches, will his bat be out of the lineup? No, he hits on days that he okay. pitches. And so he'll basically be the DH every day of the week next year. And he'll be pitching. However, every five or six or however many days the Dodgers tell us um, <laughs> they, they're, they're going to be having the rotation. Um, let's see. Uh, Norm wants to know why not pursue AJ Puck from Miami to become the left-handed bullpen option. He did well in the pen last year, even though they're trying him out as a starter this year. Again, pursuing a guy and then being interested in trading him are two different things. Miami is awful right now. I think they're now zero and eight at home this year, which is amazing. They have some promo that like if they win a home game, everyone gets a free Whopper Junior, and someone <laughs> tweeted like they're still waiting for their first Whopper Junior. So, look, there's lots of guys out there that they could go get for the bullpen. If there's a spot that is probably the easiest to go address via trade or via waivers, DFAs, that kind of thing. It's probably that I saw a question earlier about Drew Pomeranz, who's now in the Dodgers organization, Nabil, Chris, Matt, Danelson, Lamette, like these guys are all down in the minors who could come up and if proven, they could give you something. So um, I don't think they're going to be trading for a reliever three weeks into the season, even though AJ puck would be a nice piece. And I like kind of the upside, and to your point, looked good as a reliever, but Miami's not packing it in quite yet, especially with every team in the National League basically getting to make the playoffs with the new expanded postseason. Yeah. Also, there's there's not real markets for these guys. Like, you know, we could we could want them to trade for somebody, but those yeah. other teams aren't yet willing to deal guys 15 games into their season. Not yeah. it, and it might not be that they necessarily think they can make a run and get back into the playoff picture. It's more that they're trying to build a market for those guys. And yeah. you know, if if the Dodgers at this point are the only team offering anything, you know, the team who has the player that is wanted is going to end up probably taking pennies on the dollar for what they could get in say July. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, Dave H has a question here. Can a team with three potential platoons, two in the outfield, one in the infield, win in October? Also going to the game tomorrow, Jeff, you want my Bruce Dar bobblehead? Of course I want your Bruce Dar bobblehead. Oh, nice. <laughs> if you're on social media, if you're on Twitter, 
find me at Jeff Spiegel, send me a direct message. I would love to, uh, I'd love to connect with you about that. We need, we need to add, we need to, to freshen this up, you know, add more bobbleheads, always interested in bobbleheads, but Anthony, his first question, um, do you think platoons are a disadvantage in October? Do you think they're an advantage or do you think they're neutral? I think they're neutral. It depends on the players that you have platooning. Um, but you know, I, I think every team that's been in the World Series and every team that's won the World Series has had platoons. Um, you know, to have to have three and one of them is, you know, maybe sort of soft, kind of depending. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that's out of the ordinary. I don't think it's um, a situation that, you know, the reason you're doing it is because you believe it's going to make your team better. Like if you if you're if you have a guy who struggles on from one side of the plate or or against, you know, a certain handed pitcher. Um, and he has to play, and you don't have another option. So he has to play and he hits 115 against that handed pitcher. Yeah. Your team's worse. And so, like, you know, the, I, I think it's okay that that these people, or, or I'm sorry, that these organizations have platoons. Uh, I think they're doing it for the betterment of their, you know, of, of their long term outlook. Uh, but yeah, in, in this day and age with the way, uh, advanced analytics have become such a normal part of the game, every team has some sort of platoon. Yeah. Um, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Uh, question here from KCCG, uh, with CT three strikes, not being able to hit water from a boat right now, <laughs> why isn't he bunting in the bottom of the 11 Friedman <laughs> analytics aside? The game is tied if he does. Um, so Taylor obviously came to lead off the bottom of the 11th inning and fouled out. Then Rojas grounded out. Um, and then Mookie flies out to center. So I'm not quite sure the run scores because Rojas only grounded out. But look, every time Austin Barnes comes up in a big spot, Anthony, I'm saying square up to bunt. Um, so I think Casey has a point. I would have been I would have been pro Chris Taylor just laying down a bunt, getting the guy to third with one out. Obviously, who knows if yeah. he's any good at it, but who knows if he's any good at hitting to begin with? We kind of know that one at least. <laughs> it's it's a fair question and it's a little hindsighty, right? Um, because in the 11th inning, you have a guy standing on second and a single to also ties the game. And, you know, Chris Taylor's having trouble hitting singles. I understand that. But, uh, you know, I mean, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if he fouls off strike two with the bun attempt and he strikes out that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fair one. Uh, our own account. Jeff says he's always interested in bobblehead sources say he rejected a Barnsey one from Blake Williams. Uh, no comment <laughs> on that one. No comment. Just going to let that one sit. I mean, it's not unlimited space, guys, over here. You know, you're not, it's not so like, you're not what you're saying is you're not going to cooperate with the investigation. Yeah, I'm not not saying that's true, but I'm also saying I'm interested in bobbleheads. And, uh, you know, like, I don't know where Austin Barnes would rank in the uh, in the bobblehead. I've got I've got like top tier guys. And then it kind of goes down. I've got this one's like the Manny Ramirez, Hanley Ramirez, Yasiel Puig. Those are some of my favorite guys. Then we go down towards the bottom and we've got like our, we got a Gavin Stone down there. We've got another Freddie Freeman bobblehead down there. Trey Turner's down at the bottom. Then we've got, you can't see off camera here, Anthony. We've got the throwback. So I've got Hideo Nomo, Sean Green, Andre Ethier right here off to my left. And then over on the windowsill are the, the ones that I like enough to have kept, but we're talking. Kenta Maeda, Adrian Gonzalez, and Hung Chi. I loved Hung Chi Kuo, so we've got a Hung Chi Kuo bobblehead. So I'm just saying Austin Barnes might have found some space in between Kenta Maeda and Hung Chi Kuo over here, but he's definitely not taking Sean Green <laughs> off of the shelf to my left, is all I'm saying. And Edirico says Gavin Stone has a bobblehead. Yeah, Foco, <laughs> shout out to Foco. They, it was that this is the best because they sent it's it's star rookie Gavin Stone, but it came out last year. So it's like, it's a numbered one. It's down at the bottom. It's great. So yes, Gavin Stone has a bobblehead. And when he is the greatest pitcher of all time, I'm going to have one of 500 star rookie Gavin Stone bobbleheads from 2023. So. All right. All right. Blake says you should build a higher shelf just for Barnsey. Uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> I like how he clarifies. I know I put question there. I'm a huge liar <laughs> because I said question and then didn't ask you a question. Um, that's, you know what, Blake, we're going to take all feedback into consideration and I'm going to think about that and I'll, I'll strongly consider that as an option. And, uh, yeah, that's where we'll end it on the, uh, on the uh, Austin Barnes, on the Austin Barnes debate there. Uh, <laughs> let's Bring see it to the camera. where, where's your Russell Martin bobblehead, you know, 
Uh, I used to call Russell Martin, Russell left on base, Martin. It felt like that guy was just a walking 0 for 2 with runners in scoring position. So, you know, uh, as my friend Daniel would say, no disrespect to Russell Martin. But, you know, keep in mind I am married. So, like, th- as many bobbleheads as I have is kind of a miracle that, that like, I, I my wife allows me to even have this many. We've had to make some tough decisions. I gave Blake and Scott a bag of, like, 25 old bobbleheads that that didn't make the cut of the guys you're probably saying man hung chi quo made the cut and somebody else didn't yes that's fair um oh there's matt kemp somewhere around here too matt oh matt kemp's on the show big matt kemp guy so shout out to matt kemp um i think that's it i think that's it i think that's a great place to end it there um matt kemp robbed of an mvp yeah by ryan braun were you were you in milwaukee that year man so uh, let, let's. I, I have a. I have a. I have a good story to end this on. And and yes, I do have a lot of bobbleheads. A lot of them are Nationals and Brewers because that's where I spent most of my time on the beat. Um, I do have a, a decent amount of Dodgers because Dodger Stadium was my home base when I became a National beat writer. Um, they're just not in here. Uh, yeah. They're they're in the garage, collecting dust. But uh, so my last year on the Brewers beat was uh, the 2010 season, and then I went to sporting news from there. So my relationship with Ryan Braun was sort of shaky because he was very, um, he, he would get into a tiff if anybody wrote anything semi what he considered negative. So like if he went over four and he left four guys on base and they lost by a run and we wrote that Ryan Braun left four guys on base, uh, he wouldn't talk to you for like a week. Love that. So, um we leave to the 2010 season like okay like saying we you know we'd say hi to each other but like he didn't want to talk to me yeah and so fine like you know he was busy wearing awful rim of t-shirts and affliction stuff so <laughs> you know I, I had no problem not having to deal with him well so then i get into the onto the national beat and um he has that season and matt kemp has his season and i write that Matt Kemp's season was better. Yeah. I, I thought taking, Matt Kemp, taking the steroids out of it. Like this is before all the steroids. Yeah. And we didn't even know. We didn't even know that, right? At the time. And so um Braun wins and okay, fine. You know, I, I thought Kemp got robbed. He, I thought he was a better all-around player that year. Uh, I think I think that was a year he played like gold glove caliber defense, also yeah. in a premium position. And Ryan Braun was a below average left fielder. Uh anyway, so then he gets busted. And we go into the next spring training and there's a, the whole steroid thing. And I saw Ryan Braun after I had written that column that, you know, I thought Kemp was the MVP and he was pissed about it, but he didn't see me enough. So it was, you know, like, Hey, I kind of didn't like that, but like, how have you been kind of deal? Yeah. So we were fine. So then, you know, he has the press conference the next spring in Maryvale uh, in Phoenix and at their spring training complex. And he, you know, kind of does a Raphael Palmero and points his finger at everybody and says, how dare you accuse me of cheating? I'm the best thing since Babe Ruth. Um, you guys will all pay for this basically. And then obviously every, you know, the house comes crumbling down and he gets busted. And I write that he is very similar to Alex Rodriguez in, in all of this. And they were both university of Miami guys. Um, and, and they ended up, they were, they were close friends. Like not a lot of people knew that. Um, and then after that, he just, he was totally done with me. Love it. I love it. And I do have a, and I have a Ryan Braun bobblehead in my garage somewhere. Yeah, there you go. Hey, that's, uh, look, that checks out. Let's let's just say that, that every story about Ryan Braun seems to uh, be painted with the same, same strokes and, and checks out. So, uh, there you go. There you go. Hey, folks, thanks for joining us tonight. Again, 1,500 people here still at almost midnight. We appreciate you joining us on a Friday night. Anthony out and I will be here on Friday nights doing live post-game shows. Um, most of the time, there will be there will be a show on Friday nights, but it will be Anthony and I as much as possible. On Sunday nights, we've got um, our podcast. Blake and Matt will be on it. I'll be back on that show in a few weeks as well. So excited about that. You've got Scott and me on Tuesday nights. So you got three live shows a week, Tuesday night, Friday night, Sunday night. And then on top of that, in case you missed it, we are starting to do a daily morning video as well. It's going to be a quick Dodger Heads daily type thing, recapping the night before, previewing the game ahead, as well as talking about what is the one big storyline from the last 24 hours. So make sure you subscribed here to the Dodger Blue YouTube page, Dodger Blue 1958. 
Um, make sure you check out Dodger Blue 1958 on social media, of course, and then DodgerBlue.com, full game recap, that kind of thing. That is Anthony Wittrado. I am Jeff Spiegel. We appreciate you for joining us. Dodgers lose a tough one, 8-7, to seven, but they're back in action tomorrow against the Padres. Enjoy the rest of your night, folks. As always, go Dodgers.